in order to find out whether or not a vehicle has the right reusable properties to be interesting, you don't need it in one flight, or 10 flights, or even 100 flights. We're going to need thousands of flights to find out whether we have achieved the levels of reliability and reusability that are economically interesting for this industry to become a real transportation sector of the economy. Only then is it credible to think about building an orbital system that achieves those same attributes in a fully reusable orbital vehicle. Technologically, it is not part. It's, it's more capital cost involved because the vehicles have to be somewhat larger to build an orbital system. But you, know, you add up the numbers in the rocket equation, the delta V of two suborbital vehicles stacked on top of each other reaches orbit. Uh, so the ultimate technological maturation we're doing with these suborbital vehicles is we're going to finally figure out how to achieve routine, reliable, cost-effective access to orbital space. And as Heinlein said, once you're in orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. So we've gone from the press's impression of this industry as somehow this playground for a couple of rich people to realizing it's the other way around. Those rich people and the others like them, the paid researchers like Alan or, and, the, and the customers who are out there in the audience who are the early pioneers of payload flights are enabling a sector of the you know, human planetary economy that is gonna be just as important and just as enabling in the 21st century as aircraft were in the 20th and ocean-going vessels were in the 14th. Um, and I think they deserve our thanks. And that's all I wanted to say. Well, I would dub this a very successful experiment for the NSRC. Great talk. And we do have time for questions. So, uh, actually, Jeff, you know almost everybody here. You can feel them yourself, hands up. If you'd like to comment on this, ask a question about Jeff's thoughts. Come on, no one at all? There you go. So, is it uh, advisable for everyone to do suborbital operations before going to orbit? Or if you have enough money, can you just go straight to the orbit? When it comes to when it comes to how one would best structure a venture to develop space transportation, anything anyone says about it, no matter how confidently spoken, is an opinion because it isn't done. Uh, and I am reluctant to go where some colleagues have gone and assert that my opinions have precedence over their opinions. Um, what's neat about this phase in history is that many different approaches are being tried. Of course, I think the approach that we're trying is the one that's best. Otherwise, I would be doing it differently. Um, but, uh, you know, if we, if, if no, no transportation industry has ever become successful with a single successful intro. So neither, neither will this industry. There will be multiple successful entrants. We will all try different things. And what will make this phase of trace transportation different from those in the past, where there was only one entity and it was the US government or, or a national government, is when there are multiple competing private ventures and they try things, some of those things work better than others. And then the successful ideas are copied and the unsuccessful ideas are quickly eliminated. Uh, and the best practices will proliferate through the industry. What I do feel fairly confident in asserting is that whether it be suborbital or not, a fairly large database of flights is going to be required before economically effective reuse is achieved. Uh, and I prefer the approach of doing suborbital over orbital first because I don't have all the money in the universe and it's cheaper to learn those lessons suborbitally and faster to learn those lessons suborbitally than it is orbital. I'll let you point, and I'll 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 turn it on. Yeah. yeah, Jeff. Um, several years ago, Jim Cameron gave gave NASA some interesting advice um, about uh, messaging. He said he said first of all, you need to tell your story better, and then he said second, you need a better story to tell. <laughs> um, 
so where's the problem here? Is it that we're not telling our story right or we don't have the right story to tell or some combination of both and what can we do to fix it? I think we do have the right story to tell but we've only had it recently. Um, and well, kudos to Alan and others for helping to arrange conferences like this because that's part of what helps make the rest of the story visible. And, um, you know, my own experience with conveying stories out to the public has been you can talk about abstractions until you're blue in the face, but until they have concrete examples that they don't get. Um, nobody thought uh, that people could pay their own way to space until people did. Uh, and people aren't going to get that suborbital vehicles or platforms for research until they do something. Now, one would think, perhaps, if one is more literate in the history of the industry, that you know, the, the large number of flight experiments, for example, that flew on the X-15 quite successfully, uh, would have been illustrative. But that was a long time ago when people had forgotten. Uh, so the early adopters in the research community, you folks, um, have to get those payloads ready, and you have to fly a few of them, and one of them has to do something that gets, you know, hits the cover of science news. And, and then it will always have been obvious, and we'll be in that phase where everybody knew it was a good idea all the time. Um, question about X vehicles and their usefulness, in particular for some work. We've gone beyond the point where an X vehicle an X-15 to research suborbital is probably more of a, a hindrance than it helps me. I know that probably an X-vehicle like DCX to get to orbit is probably useful. But what about suborbital? Yeah, I think we had an X-vehicle figuring out how to do suborbital and it was the X-15. Um, the I don't see the I don't see that either at our company or at the other portions of the industry that I observe that there are remaining technological unknowns between where we are and so our vehicles. And for the kinds of issues that I think are unknowns, having to do with how do you push the maintenance man hours for flight and and so forth, X vehicles are not outrageously good at at uncovering those kinds of things because they tend to be built like research airplanes are built. And just like, which is how the shuttle was built as a researcher. And <laughs> operability is not usually one of the parameters that you get out of an extreme project like that. Um, for orbit, different story, definitely. Uh, as, as our own lessons learned and accumulated over the years, and our own designs for what we think us, our orbital system will begin to look like and take in shape, um, we continue to ask ourselves the question. You know, how many predecessor vehicles do we have to build, you know, zero, one, or two uh, before we're ready to tap on that orbital system? And that, that's a discussion that will be ongoing while the design of that is ongoing. And I would love to see uh, a, a general purpose test bed X vehicle that we could use as a test bed platform for things like home protection system technologies. But if it doesn't happen and the industry proceeds as we all hope and expect, um, we'll just have to do that. I'm Rusty Rogers with Moonback Media, Moonback.com. Um, our focus is this industry, and uh, Jeff, you've had a lot of less than pleasant things to say about the media, um, and we need to know what it would take to move the general public to follow space more closely and does it take one thing or are we looking at incremental things and what would they be? I'm not sure I am qualified to have much of an opinion on the question of what it takes to make the general public interested in space. But I'm not sure it's the right question. Uh, uh, and first off, let me say what I have. The, 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 the specialty media that follows this industry is not the source of the problem. Uh, 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 it, it, it's more when we get out of the, into the communications media into the phone call that we get into the um, A lot of good people have spent a lot more time than I have 
trying to answer the question of how do we get everybody to care about space again? And I'm a bit of a contrarian on that subject because I think that that's putting the cart before the horse. I think when we are doing interesting, important, useful things, the public will care. Uh, and until then, I'm not sure they will. But there's an intermediate ground between people who are already following space and you know everybody on the street. And, and I am, what I am most dismayed by is the people who are trying to get information about this industry because they already have developed some understanding. People who are institutional investors, for example, I run into this a lot. They've already tried to learn something, otherwise I wouldn't be in there talking to them. But what they know is wrong. Uh, and I don't know the answer to how we solve that problem. But step one is, is acknowledge we have a problem. And that's why I came to you. Uh, Jeff, one more question. Uh, you uh, were a member of the Augustine Commission and had the dubious honor of actually advising the government. Uh, what would be your current top items on your list for what the government should do and should not do in order to facilitate the kind of game changing you're talking about here? <laughs> Well, at some point, you know, trying to jab more adrenaline in the heart of a dead horse is um, counterproductive. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, you know, the committee that I was on, and I was, I was proud to serve on, um, gave what I thought was, was pretty good advice to the federal government. By and large, the federal government, viewed as a collective enterprise, has not chosen to benefit from that advice. No more than it chose to benefit from the quite comparable advice of the four or five presidential commissions that preceded it. And the day of reckoning is at hand, as it is in so many other areas of our national policy right now, where, where the, the attempt to push off to the unpleasant future the, the truths one would prefer not to acknowledge today. You know, John Maynard Keynes said in the long run we'll all be dead, but guess what? The long run came early. Uh, and, and here we are, and, and some things are going to have to be dealt with, and they're not going to be a lot of fun. So I take no pleasure in having predicted that. I, 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 I had hoped that, that saying the same things that we all have seen coming more clearly, more loudly, and more obviously, I hope he has hope that, that I wouldn't suffer Cassandra's faith and that, that uh, it might be in time to do some good, but it wasn't. Um, so I don't expect NASA to be a growth industry as far as opportunities for space transportation and space industrialization in the near term. I would love to be wrong about that, but uh, you know, I, I don't expect it. Thank you. Okay, if you want to say to the